So this morning, we're here for the ACM Northeast Conference here in Burlington, Vermont, and we have quite a session planned for you this morning and many, many workshops for you to enjoy and celebrate community media. And I am so glad to see all the familiar and new faces in this room, and many people have changed positions and are growing in our industry, and this is fantastic. And I want to celebrate all the positivity that we have created and that we embrace during these tough times. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce to you um, many people, but first I would like to thank the, co uh, the conference committee for all their hard work and endless hours to make this happen. Uh, this is not a single person job. It takes many, many, many hands to make this happen. And I would like to thank Megan O'Rourke, Rob Chapman, Debbie Rogers is not in the room and is at registration right now, Barbara Chisholm, Jim Palmer, Tim Egan, and if I forgot somebody, Bernardo, T Tim Egan, um, fantastic. And I'm sorry if I did forget anybody because it, we had a lot of people working on it. Keith Thibodeau, yes, can't forget Keith with the vendors. And I know I'm forgetting somebody else too, Glenn Williams. Um, so I want to thank everybody. And this morning we are going to start off. Um, we have the chief innovation officer from the city of Burlington, Vermont, and he's going to come up here and tell us a little bit about himself in, in Burlington. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I can't believe they've locked me behind a podium. Normally when I do these, I wander all over the place. So we'll see what, how this works. Um, I want to say thank you first for uh, inviting me, Megan, to uh, speak this morning. I won't take too much time, I promise, because you have way more pertinent speakers than myself um, to listen to today. So I want to say first and foremost, uh, welcome to Burlington and congratulations on missing foliage season but landing smack dab in the middle of stick season. I don't think everybody, <laughs> there you go. I don't think everybody appreciates just how stick season goes. Um, and while you're here, I hope you do get out and enjoy Burlington. Uh, we have some amazing restaurants and definitely, I remember years ago when my daughter was probably 10 years old, we met my parents in Pintwater, Michigan. And every night we would walk to the lake and my mother would say, have you ever seen a sunset like that? And my daughter was 10, she's kind of a sassy, sassy 10 year old at the time. And, but she was very polite and then later she said, I just wanted to tell her, Nana, yeah, see that every night in Burlington. So make sure while you're here, hopefully you're here for two or three nights, and you get out and you hopefully will get some great sunsets over Lake Champlain and the Adirondacks. So please enjoy the fair city um, and, you know, maybe eat, drink, be merry, leave a few dollars here behind, and uh, we appreciate it. So um, while we, as, as we're gathering here to have you all talk about best practices and ideas and share some innovation around the idea of community media, I wanted to chat a little bit about our local partner, and Megan, I don't know where she went, but um, uh, there she is, uh, Town Meeting TV, CCTV, and we talk about the important relationship that we have between Burlington and Town Meeting TV. Um, and Megan said, hey, can you talk a little bit about the transparency that that offers? And transparency into municipal government is a huge piece of the puzzle with CCTV, town meeting TV. Uh, there's no doubt that that is a big part of where we're at. But I actually wanted to not only reinforce the importance of that, but talk a little bit about what I think is an equally important piece of the puzzle, which is accessibility and equity in terms of how does how do we get that out of CCTV as well? Um, community media plays a huge role, not only in the transparency of, as I said, municipal government, but also in making sure that it's accessible to the people of the community. Um, if, if we talked about it from the accessibility perspective, it it's, makes meetings more accessible because, uh, well, where did I, I lost my, see, I, I usually have all these memorized too. Um, they're usually, uh, 
there's, there can be time limits for people trying to get to that meeting. So they oftentimes have to watch a recording because they're working in the, during the middle of the meeting. We have meetings that started, my wife happens to be on the Church Street Commission. She started a meeting yesterday at nine in the morning. Sometimes city council meetings on Monday nights run until one in the morning. It's tough to maybe get to all of those, but 90% of them are recorded somehow. And CCTV, town meeting TV plays a huge role in that. We're also talking about more accessibility from people with sight or hearing uh, challenges where they're gonna get to captions. You can see there are some vendors out there, I kind of strolled around real quick. There's at least two of them out there that provide live captions and one of them that provides translation on the fly. So we're a refugee resettlement city, for instance. We have, I wanna say there were 27 languages spoken in Flynn Elementary where my daughter went to elementary school. If all those people want to be engaged in the process of government, CCTV is one of the first places they're gonna stop because not only do they, can they watch a recording, they can get the transcript, they can translate the transcript, and then it makes sense to them from their perspective. Again, showing you not only how it makes government transparent to those people, but also uh, accessibility. And because accessibility equals equity, we're working, we're leveraging that to try to make it a more equitable uh, process. Um, there also, um, there's also the, the idea of, we talk about uh, during COVID, everything went online, which I have to praise CCTV and T uh, Town Meeting TV for making that happen and helping us make all of our meetings go totally live or totally uh, remote. Now that we're back to normal, I guess, I think somebody called it the new normal one time, we like to think of it from the perspective of, we can't go back to all 100% in-person meetings. Yes, we're gonna have in-person meetings and every, every meeting will have an in-person content to it, but we have to have those hybrid all the time because of what we were just talking about, because of the transparency, because of the accessibility, because of the equity issues. You have to have a hybrid approach and partners like Community Media are huge in providing that. And I wanna say again, thank you to our partners there. Uh, we could not do it without Town Meeting TV. We couldn't do it without CCTV. And the ability for us to go forward in a very hybrid model where we're not only in person, but broadcasting that live on Channel 17, but also where you can, you can see recordings of it on YouTube and other places. Um, we can download video and put it in our meeting software if we need to. There's a multitude of ways that that transparency, accessibility, and equity really open up in terms of using community media. So I wanna say thank you again to all of you out there. You all serve that same important vital role in your communities. And uh, I'm excited for you to be able to get together and share some innovation, share some ideas, and share some networking, some, some conversations, and hopefully a few laughs along the way. So thank you again for coming. I appreciate you all being here, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing how it goes from Megan. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. It's great to hear a city so committed to being transparent and working with community media. It's uh, really inspiring. And when we think of inspiring, that makes us think of the alliance of community media and our president, Mike Wassenaar. Please come to the stage. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's great to be back in Burlington. Um, I first came to the shores of Lake Champlain in the middle of January 2015. <laughs> Perfect time for this Minnesotan to, to uh, break bread with uh, friends from Vermont for the first time. Um, it, the state has an extraordinary uh, network of community access uh, channels, which have a exemplary record of service. For communities that very often are isolated, do not have local news service or have diminished news service, have information needs like every other, like every other American community, and yet 
Uh, I, I'm proud to say we're in a state that has probably the highest per capita um, service levels. So for a state of 600,000 people to have 26, 24 uh, access management organizations providing information services to people on a daily basis is quite extraordinary. Um, and so it's, it's great for ACM Northeast to be in Vermont again. It's great to be back uh, at the, the, the northern part of the state. Uh, uh, last time I was in Vermont was in Brattleboro uh, as part of both ACM Northeast's work there and then also the, the um, roadshow that ACM National did a couple years back. You know, um, the, the thing that I remark about when I am with folks around the country when I point to Vermont uh, is I point to the possible. Because many states that have greater populations but have the same needs do not have the resources that you have to be able to meet the needs of people in your neighborhoods, in your communities. Um, and it's something that has to be preserved and expanded and modeled. Okay. So as you're doing your work connecting with folks uh, around the region and actually around the country, there are some people from around the country who are here at the, at the national conference, I I'd like you to think about those things. Very often we think about preserving the things we have, um, especially in, in the context of changing technology platforms, different audience, different audiences, uh, uh, changing uh, audience needs and preferences, um, changing changing uh, media styles. We very often think about digging our heels in and hanging on to what we have, hanging on to our subscriber bases, hanging on to franchise fees, hanging on to, to franchise support, hanging on to the relationships that we have with institutions that are changing around us, right? So yes, please, hang on. But also think about what is to come and how to be vital in the future of your community, right? If we're thinking just about trying to recreate what we had 30 years ago, we'll never get anywhere in our work. We have to be thinking about what the next 30 years looks like for service to communities, how our communities will be changing, and how their information needs will be changing, and how we can model our work to be able to be in the essential place. Okay? So the thing that I would ask you to think about is think about, I know you're in a beautiful place, even though it is stick season. Think about being in the essential place as your communities are, are growing and changing. Right? So that's part of our work here over the course of the next couple of days as we talk about uh, practice, we talk about policies we're trying to build, we talk about some of the struggles that are happening at state houses, particularly here in the Northeast, there's actually some very, very exciting work that's happening at the legislative level in state houses in the Northeast that I think a lot of places around the country, a lot of other states around the country are looking at and wondering about. So we'll talk about that in the next couple of days. But think about what we can build, build together, right? That's actually the purpose for us coming together here, not just to have a great time and to enjoy the breakfast burrito here at the Hilton. <laughs> I didn't travel all this way just for that breakfast burrito. I came here to help think about what we can be doing to build something better for our communities for the next 30 years. Okay? So I hope that you think about that over the course of the next three days. And I look forward to uh, sharing uh, with you uh, that spirit over the course of the rest of the conference. And it's great to be back in Burlington. Thank you. Good morning again. I believe now Rob Chapman has some video introductions to present. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Burlington. All right. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I am, uh, unfortunately, a, a former Vermonter. <laughs> 
But uh, my heart belongs in Burlington. I lived many years here, and that view is just stunning. I hope you all got a chance to enjoy the sunset. If you didn't, there'll be another one this evening, I hope. So, um, I, you know, I am the committee chair uh, for the conference, uh, and I just wanted to take a moment to recognize the incredible amount of work that people have put into putting this conference together. We've been working on this. When did you call me, Helen? I think it was November last year, and said, Rob, we got to do a conference. And I'm like, let's go to Burlington, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's too many people to, to thank you and, and recognize for the work that they've been doing, but I do want to just single out the, the programming committee that worked on putting together a great workshops and these, op these plenaries. You know who you are, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. I'll tell you again and again, uh, personally, when I see you, but. So uh, my job today is to introduce the uh, videos that we've gotten from the legislative, uh, our representatives in Washington. Um, Many people are aware of somebody by the name of Bernie Sanders, uh, who has run for president a couple times. And we worked hard to try to get something from Bernie, uh, but he was uh, very busy. I guess he is actually refereeing some fights on the Senate floor. <laughs> so he's uh, taking care of some of that kind of business taking down on the Senate floor. So he was unable to do a video, but we do have videos from our other representatives in Washington. Hello, it's Peter Welch. I think the first one is Peter Welch. Person, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Is Peter Welch. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person to welcome you all to Vermont's Queen City. And I surely hope you take the time to enjoy Lake Champlain, the Church Street Marketplace, and all that Burlington and Vermont have to offer while you're in town. We have always known that democracy does not function if voters don't have access to accurate, reliable information. And that's more apparent now than it's ever been which makes what you do all the more crucial. You don't just tell people what their government is doing, you show them. On your channels and websites, citizens can watch the whole select board meeting, the entire press conference, or the entire town hall meeting. They don't have to rely on someone else to tell them what happened. It's an incredibly important way to halt misinformation. And during the COVID pandemic, I know many of you went beyond broadcasting meetings to working with your local government to make it possible for the public to participate remotely. Thank you. In Vermont, work on media broadcast and stream the governor's press conferences live to tens of thousands of people, providing an absolutely essential service of reliable information. Stations in Vermont have also worked with the congressional delegation to broadcast town halls and other forums, giving constituents a chance to hear directly from their senators and representatives. I thank you for that and for the essential and often unacknowledged work you do every day to enrich and inform your communities. I want you to continue being able to do that work, which is why I'm very proud to join with my colleagues, Senator Markey of Massachusetts, to support Protecting Community Television Act to let all of you receive the full cash value of cable franchise fees and not allow cable companies to subtract in-kind contributions from the funds Congress has intended to support our community media stations. I'll stick with that. Thank you again for what you do and, and, and enjoy your time here in Vermont. You couldn't ask for better hosts than the folks at Vermont Access Network. And so we have a, a video from our newest representative, Becca Bailent, who uh, took over for Peter when he moved up to senator. She's been there just uh, not even a year yet. She was started in January. Uh, and you know, I now work and live in Massachusetts, and I see her all over in the national press. She's been doing, uh, really stirring things up in, in Washington. So this is Becca Bailent, our, our newest representative from Vermont, which we only have one because we're such a small state. Hello, I'm so pleased to speak to you at the Northeast Conference of the Alliance for Community Media. For those of you traveling from afar, welcome to Vermont. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but it's important to me to honor the critical work you all do. I ran for Congress because I'm gravely concerned about the state of our democracy. Civic engagement and citizen access to local government is so important to the survival and health of any democracy. An informed citizenry is fundamental to self-government 
and in an era when big media companies are increasingly consolidating and leaving behind local connections and obligations, it's more important than ever that we support community media. I know that Brattleboro Community Television, the community media in my hometown, is so important to many folks in my town and county. It helps to keep them up with local events and key local government meetings. I know this because it's been so important to me too. And right here in Burlington, Channel 17, CCTV Center for Media and Democracy, is an amazing institution that provides comprehensive access to local government all over Chittenden County, as well as great event coverage and the key services of the Vermont Language Justice Project. I know these organizations are just two of the many that are represented here from all over New, New England. You are the eyes and the ears of our democracy. In a fractured media landscape, you provide grounded, local, caring coverage that we all need to be citizens in a stable, educated, democratic society. Thank you for what you do, and please enjoy your time here in Burlington. Okay, so uh, in a few minutes, we're gonna get into sort of the conversation we've been wanting to have with this open plenary, but I did wanna just say that, uh, you know, as committee chair, I am uh, very, much want to hear from you as to what, what your experience has been like with the committee. So there are other board members here. Uh, do we have, uh, can the ACM Northeast board members uh, in the room please just give a stand and to recognize everybody? So today's uh, conversation is we are calling partnering for a transparent and active local democracy. Uh, Moderating the conversation is Olga Peters, who I understand works with BC uh, TV in Brattleboro, uh, is a freelance uh, videographer and content provider. Uh, she can probably introduce herself a little bit better than I have, because I haven't met Olga yet, but uh, hopefully she's in the room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, then we have a very special guest, the uh, Secretary of State from the state of Vermont, Sarah Copeland Hansis. I got it right? <laughs> who has agreed to sit and take your questions and sort of have a conversation about just how important, what an important role is local, local media plays in our communities and in our uh, democracy. So uh, thank you, Olga and uh, Sarah, if you can make your way up to the stage here. I think uh, we have chairs for you and some mics. So excuse me, folks, while I set up my timer. Um, and while I do that, welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Olga. It's nice to be here. What a beautiful morning to be on the shores of Lake Champlain. I hope you all got outside. Yes, for those who don't know uh, Secretary Sarah Copeland Hansas, or Kan. Kansas, uh, Kansas. Rhymes with Kansas. Oh, she always tells me that, and I always Think say it Topeka. Wrong. <laughs> um, she served for many years as an educator and also a small business owner, and also as a member of the House of Representatives until she was elected in 2022 to serve as Secretary of State after Jim Condo stepped down. So, very glad to have you here and glad to have you as. Uh, Secretary of State, one of our democracy people. Thank you very much. Um, for folks who aren't from Vermont, I would love if you could just give us a quick overview of your experience with um, community media centers mm -hmm. and you, uh, some of the things your office is working on right now that might be of interest to to the folks here. Great. Well, since we have folks who are assembled from a number of different states, I'll just give you the quick rundown of what the Vermont Secretary of State does. Uh, we have uh, four main divisions and two special programs. So we oversee Vermont's archives and records um, in a giant warehouse in Middlesex. Um, we have wonderful assemblage of uh, press clippings and uh, we are the keepers of the archival um, now video footage from Vermont legislature. 
Uh, you can see uh, the actual original hand um, scripted constitution of the state of Vermont in our archives. It's a really fun place to be, and I, I keep hoping that at some point they'll, they'll just forget that I'm in the archives and leave <laughs> me for the, for the night, because I think it would be a really cool place to get stuck. Um, uh, so, so in addition to archives, we also do professional licensure. So anything from architects and engineers to um, tattoo artists to uh, the nursing profession, um, many, many different professions in Vermont are, uh, are licensed by our Office of Professional Regulation. Uh, we have the Business Services Division. We are the first stop for any business um, that is being established in Vermont, uh, and that is a really wonderful, special place to be, one that we really tried to lean into and leverage along with our professional licensure this past summer when Vermont um, experienced catastrophic flooding in many places. Uh, we really wanted to make sure we got information uh, out to the businesses and licensed professionals who would be able to come in and help Vermonters recover from the floods. Um, and then our fourth division, uh, perhaps the most high profile, hopefully the one that Vermonters interact with uh, most consistently, which is the elections division. Um, and we train 246 town clerks to be the local elections administrators um, for, for their communities, and we compile and certify the results. Our two special programs, one is the Safe at Home program, which is an address confidentiality program for survivors of uh, domestic abuse or stalking or human trafficking. Uh, the legislature this year just expanded the scope of folks who are eligible to participate in Safe at Home to uh, providers of uh, gender affirming care or reproductive health care and patients of those services if they uh, are worried about harassment from uh, from someone due to their uh, providing or using those healthcare services. And then the last special program that I'm so excited about is our education and civic engagement program. And our ECE coordinator, Robin Palmer, is uh, here with me today. Um, we are embarking on a real intense focus in civics, civic engagement, and helping Vermonters understand how to do democracy. Uh, and, and that is really uh, so very important in this era when uh, misinformation uh, or just lack of information breeds e either uh, apathy or outright anger at government. Uh, I really feel that Vermonters need, uh, need help understanding how to do democracy. How do you make your government do for you what you can't accomplish on your own? Um, and so that's, uh, that's the general focus of our civics program. We can dive into a lot of the details of that if you want to. Um, but how, we, how have I interacted mm. with, uh, with community television? Um, over the years, I have found that it, it's one of the most consistent ways of getting out to the different communities in Vermont. Um, with you know, the decline in print media and uh, the fact that uh, the larger networks are, are taken over by uh, out-of-state folks who don't necessarily um, commit to covering a local town meeting. When I've been out on the road uh, in my 18 years in the legislature trying to get community engagement and action and involvement on the issues that were important uh, to me and to my constituents, oftentimes it was those community access uh, stations that would come and cover the meeting and help to amplify our message uh, out to more people. And I think that's critically important for folks uh, to be able to stay connected in what's going on mm -hmm. around their community as well as around the state. Thank you, Secretary. I really appreciate that last bit because I don't know about folks in other parts of the country, but in Vermont, I live in southern Vermont, and we're actually in a media market desert. So a lot of our news comes from Boston, which Boston's a very interesting place, but we're not voting in Boston. Uh, and so it's channels like Brattleboro Community Television, uh, where I'm a host and producer of the Montpelier Happy Hour. And they make our video versions look so good, Emily Kornheiser <laughs> and I, so thank you. Um, and, and we find that a lot of people, when they're angry at government, it's because they don't have those civic skills. Yes. And they don't understand the process, and so they get frustrated with the process. So thank you, um, Secretary. 
How do you see community media centers' role in protecting their community's right to free expression and access to information? Um, I don't think there's anyone else who's, who's occupying that space right now. Um, and I think it's critically important for, um, for people to be able to stay involved in that way, to be able to watch the entire select board meeting, to be able to see that community forum. Um, you know, back to the floods this past summer in, uh, I was focused on Montpelier um, in attending those community meetings because our offices are in Montpelier um, and it was such a devastating impact. Um, but, you know, there was a gathering of over 300 people and covered by the local Orca media um, so that people who either couldn't get to the meeting or didn't feel comfortable gathering because of health concerns would be able to stay involved. And, uh, and to hear the concerns of their neighbors and to come together around solutions moving forward. And that's really uh, repeated over and over again in so many different ways uh, with mm -hmm. these community access stations where um, you know, communities can come together around a problem and you can involve more people, people who maybe can't come at the six o'clock dinner hour because they are trying to get their kids to bed, but would like to be able to participate, would like to be able to pay attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The funding landscape for community media centers, as you are probably all aware, has really been in flux with the de decline in cable subscribers. And uh, this year, the state legislature ha actually routed some general fund support, excuse me with my microphone, um, th for Vermont's 24 community media centers through your office. And now that the Vermont Access Network is seeking more of a long-term solution, how do you see that relationship continuing, or what role do you see for, for your office playing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the sky's the limit. It's a really, um, it's, it's an amazing collaboration and so much of the goals in particular of our education and civic engagement program are right in line with what these community media centers do that um, I, think, I, I think it could be a really beautiful collaboration. Um, you know, I, I hear time and time again, you know, uh, Vermonters who are frustrated or have a challenge with something, and they're not sure which level of government. Is this a local issue? Is this a, mm. a state issue? Is this a federal issue? Is it all of the above? And I think that really uh, bearing down and leveraging that local coverage uh, is going to help Vermonters orient to where they should go in their advocacy. And so, you know, we were happy to be the, uh, you know, the, the granting agency uh, to, to hold this general fund money and, and to pass it along. Um, and we will also um, absolutely be advocating for continuation of that funding for our community access uh, centers because uh, we know that, uh, that this is so critically important to our democracy and these services don't pay for themselves. Mm. I'm, I'm curious, I know you're still relatively new to the office, but have you had a chance at all to talk with your peers across the country and, and see how these issues are sitting for them or if they are engaged with them or? So I haven't spoken to them in particular about um, the importance of, of community media. Um, but we do talk about the importance of civics and civic engagement. Uh, and, and it really is a concern for many of us as secretaries of state who oversee elections. Um, and you know, from my perspective, in my 18 years in the House, I always stood outside on election day and talked with people who were coming back and forth from the mm -hmm. polls. And, um, and I would also talk with people who just happened to be walking by. And I would say, you know, hey, Susan, are you, are you heading up to vote? Because <laughs> Susan's heading in that direction. <laughs> Wrong way, um, Susan. <laughs> you know, and, and invariably, people will say things like, uh, I don't vote because I don't know any of the people mm. or, or candidates who are on the ballot. Um, 
or I don't vote because my vote doesn't matter. You know, they're just going to do what those you know few wealthy elite people want them to do anyway. So why should I bother? Um, and so secretaries of state across the country hear stories like this and and see this frustration and apathy on the part of voters. And so I think that this uh, this collaboration uh, with our local media is going to be very valuable and. Uh, I hope it becomes a model for other states to consider doing a similar level of support. Thank you. You mentioned at the, the beginning of uh, this discussion about some of the initiatives your office is working on, but you're also working on a larger project uh, called the Civic Health Index Project. And um, from what I understand, this looks really interesting. It's through the National Conference on Citizenship. Uh, their website is ncoc.org if anyone wants to find more information. But it's an organization that's kind of looking at the, civic ov the overall civic health of, of a community. And what they have found is that communities with these indicators tend to have higher employment, tend to have stronger schools, tend to have better physical health, and tend to have more responsive governments. Um, they're currently working with 35 states. Uh, Vermont being one of them, would love to hear more about this and why your office became yes. involved. Yes, well you have done a perfect uh, <laughs> overview and, and uh, view of what the Civic Health Index is. Um, we, we've shorthanded it the CHI in our office because we've got so many different projects going on right now that we, uh, we need to shorthand it. But the Civic Health Index uh, project is, is a wonderful collaboration of a number of different uh, organizations around the state, um, the Vermont Humanities Council, uh, Serve Vermont, the Vermont Council on Rural Development, the Office of Racial Equity in Vermont, uh, our League of Cities and Towns, uh, the University of Vermont Center for Rural Studies, YMCA, the Vermont Agency of Education, and certainly we hope the CCTV stations and, and the community access stations around the state. Um, and what we are hoping to get from this is a, is a, a, a greater understanding and, and perhaps even a roadmap of, of where are we seeing uh, higher community involvement, higher civic health, and where are we seeing lower. And I think that um, Knowing the rural state as I do, I think we could probably imagine that it is in the rural areas where it's harder to stay civically engaged. You've got to drive longer to get to work, takes more time in your day, makes it harder to participate in things happening in your local community. I think we can imagine also um, some deficits in terms of the civic health of our younger population. Mm -hmm. I have kids who are in their 20s. Um, they don't currently live in Vermont, um, but I do talk to them and to their peers who do still live here. And there's a lot of frustration about the magnitude of the challenges that our country and our state are facing right now. And they don't see a lot of people stepping up with really clear um, plans for addressing them. You know, I'm talking about things like their student loan debt and how the heck am I ever going to be able to afford to buy a house? and you know, get married and have kids. I mean, we're looking at climate change and, and increasing climate disasters. Is that really where, you know, so there's just, there's a lot of unrest among young people. And I think that, um, I think that engaging and empowering young people will help us, uh, help them overcome the, uh, the apathy, the, uh, the anger, mm -hmm. the, the frustration with, uh, with not seeing progress on some of these really big issues. Um, so the other thing that I suspect that the Civic Health Index will show us is that low-income people have a, a harder time yeah. um, staying, uh, staying engaged um, and uh, volunteering in community, attending community meetings, serving on community boards. Mm -hmm. And when, when we get these results, um, we will really use them as a, a roadmap for where we go. How do we engage Vermonters? How do we empower them to make the change that will be relevant in their lives? Mm -hmm. And so looking forward to the, the Civic Health Index. Uh, it's a really wonderful group of partners that will give us a nice, uh, 
you know, 360 degree view of uh, Vermont and Vermonters and how they participate civically. This nerd right here is really excited. Can't wait for the report to come out. I think you brought up a really important point, though, when you mentioned folks who are living on low incomes. We have a lot of media out there in the big wide world, but I'm always cognizant of how much of it you have to pay to access. And it makes me more appreciative of things like libraries or community media centers that have a very low bar, um, bar to access yes. uh, information, which I just feel is really, as you said, crucial for um, yes. an engaged citizenry. Yeah, I mean, if we want a thriving democracy, we need to make it easy to access information. And the barrier to access uh, shouldn't have to be a, a subscription or, uh, you know, a, a thousand dollar cell phone <laughs> or you know a tablet or whatever mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure that we keep working on um, access that will uh, reach everyone thank you thank you secretary we have as I understand it some time for questions before we go on to questions though is there anything else you'd like to add or well share with I, me I thought you were going to throw out a little quiz for these folks to That's see if right. they could remember I was. Yes. I was and I got so nervous about talking to everyone that I forgot about my little quiz so this will warm them up right this like, will warm, they'll yep. participate in this and then they'll have lots of questions <laughs> <laughs> so I was just curious anyone want to take a shot at naming the five freedoms that are outlined in the First Amendment. And even you can just guess one and, and hope other people will dive in with the other four. Speech. Religion. Awesome, yep. Assembly. Pardon? Mm-hmm. Yep. Petition that, your government. A lot of yeah. people forget that one, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh gosh, you guys have missed. You Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to get worried there for a minute. Uh -oh. I was wondering if uh, if we were going to forget the one that uh, most closely aligns with why you all are here, which is freedom of the press. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and sorry to the sound person if I just uh, dropped my did thing you, did and you your break headphones like exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so, any uh, any questions for Secretary? Yes, we do have a mic behind you. There's a mic behind you. Oh, how many times have you been filming meetings and someone says, "I have a loud voice. I don't need a microphone." Oh, I I have a loud voice, but I'll be respectful. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Tim Egan. I'm actually part of the uh, ACM New England uh, Northeast, excuse me, uh, board. Um, but I was a two-term state rep in New Hampshire. And in my second term, we actually voted in a civics requirement for high schools. I don't know if Vermont has that, but knowing the relationship schools have, high schools have with community media stations, yes. is there a way that they can help articulate civics programming for young people so they know the, what is available, what is required of them to be a good citizen? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so we have, uh, we have decided that, that our first focus in terms of helping young people uh, understand civics uh, will be to curate a list of civics curriculum materials for Vermont school teachers. So Robin is leading a group that we are calling the Teacher Advisory Group. Uh, they are working on a number of different projects to both create and curate um, uh, civics materials and lesson plans for, um, for our school teachers. In Vermont, we have a very stark line that uh, the education community is, uh, defends very robustly, that decisions about curriculum are never made uh, at the ballot box. <laughs> Um, and so in order to enact a, uh, a civics requirement in Vermont, what we need to do is we need to get Vermont's Board of Education to establish that as a requirement. That's going to be a conversation that we will have going forward. Uh, where we are starting now, though, is to work with, um, 
work with teachers, work with individual high schools, work with school districts to encourage them to do things like adopting uh, the civic seal on your, on your diploma. Uh, what, are the, what are the activities or um, engagements that a young person should do in order to establish that they should get that civic seal? Mm -hmm. um, this is more of the carrot as opposed to the stick, which we'll keep working on. Um, but you know, how, does, how do our community media centers play into that? So much of what needs to uh, be demonstrated by, uh, by earning that civic seal is engaging in your local democracy or engaging in a community forum. And so absolutely, if your community has a community media center, that's going to be something that, that a young person needs to know how to tap into. Um, we need more people to understand the access points that they already have. Uh, community media being one of them, um, you know, the, the My Voter page on the Secretary mm -hmm. of State's website being another, uh, you know, how do you, how do you get into the Zoom meeting to watch your local select board or city council? Um, all of these, uh, all of these activities are ones that we want more Vermonters to understand uh, as we work towards uh, that requirement for civics. Would no, I'm, I'm also the mic handler, so whoever's next. You're going to pass the mic to the next person? Um, as someone's waiting to grab the mic, just quickly, in case people don't know, the My Voter page. Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. Right. That. So um, we are really trying to double down on, on uh, making sure folks understand what they can have access to on Vermont's My Voter page. Um, you can register to vote on the My Voter page. You can change your address. You can change your registration within Vermont. Um, and we are also, for the 2024 general election, going to create a voter guide, which will be available on your My Voter page. So from the My Voter page, you can see all of the candidates or issues that are on your ballot and your uh, your voter guide, which will also be available el electronically through the My Voter page, will show you in the same order what are the offices that we're voting for, uh, who are the various candidates, and a brief statement from them along with their contact information and social media handle. Um, you know, Vermont instituted universal vote by mail in an emergency basis in 2020 to protect. Uh, the health and safety of our poll workers uh, and to make sure that people didn't have to choose between possibly catching COVID and uh, being able to exercise their right to vote. And it was so popular and we had such high turnout mm -hmm. that we came back in, in 2021 in the legislature and uh, enacted it permanently. So now Vermonters are going to get their ballot 45 days ahead of the election let's give them a voter guide also 45 days before the election so that they can use that time to find the candidate whose values most closely align with their own, um, really strengthening democracy. Fantastic. Thank you. Did I see? Yes. Yeah, good morning. Um, certainly our election system, as we know, is under attack. Um, and we work closely with our Board of Elections. And previously, there was no concern about who they were and what they were doing. And most recently in the past two years, their desire for visibility um, has gone to zero. They feel that they have become vulnerable, physically vulnerable, under attack and intimidation. And I'm wondering what you think um, the practitioners of community media can do to offset and push back on these unwitting forces that are undermining our democracy and make our environment a little bit more safer for those who not only are hired to do the work, but also volunteer yes. to do the work. Mm, good question. Thank you. And sir, what state are you from? Uh, Maryland. I'm Richard Maryland. Turner. I'm from, Mar I'm from Maryland. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so this rise in um, attacks on election workers really makes me spitting mad because what I know about these folks is that they believe deeply in uh, in good functioning elections and in their civic duty to, uh, to make sure that our elections are accessible, safe, and fair. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that community media has a role to play in helping sort of personalize 
who are these individuals who feel so strongly about democracy that they are willing to uh, serve as your local elections uh, administrators, uh, that they are willing to take the time to learn all of the steps in the process and execute them flawlessly every single time. Um, you know, I, I think that some of, some of this anger towards elections administrators is really born out of an ignorance about what they do. Uh, it's both an ignorance about who they are as individuals, but also an ignorance about what safeguards we have in place in each of our states that helps assure us that our elections are accurate and safe uh, and fair. And uh, so I think, you know, a day in the life of an elections administrator is a great uh, feature for uh, community access to do. Find your local elections administrator who, if they are willing to be uh, visible and to be on camera, um, which increasingly is, uh, is a scary thing for them because they don't want to be made targets um, by haters. But find them, find someone who will walk you through all of those processes and get that out in front of people. I, I mean, I think the vast majority of people have no idea all of the checks and steps in the, in the process of maintaining your voter registration list and seeing who's actually uh, voting on election day uh, in making sure that, uh, that our elections are fair and safe. Um, and if we can highlight that, mm -hmm. then at least we have a possibility that people won't fall victim to, uh, to this misinformation about stolen elections. We, we forget how critical having faith in our, elect, our elective process is to our democracy. And when people yes. lose trust in it, I mean, we see what happens. So yes. thank you. So, yes? Hello. Oh, it's working. Uh, I'm Pua Ford. I'm from Connecticut. Um, voter guides. Do you have other groups in the state that already do voter guides? Will you coordinate with them? Um, I'm also with the League of Women Voters, and I just did the vote411.org for three of the towns in my area. Uh, still don't know if anybody checked anything. And I found that probably we were preempted by a group of, um, uh, of parents that uh, had special questions for the Regional Board of Ed, didn't coordinate with them, but it might have been nice to coordinate with them. Mm. We, are there any possible projects for that? Yeah, you know, coordination is always valuable. Um, we, we don't really have a good sense yet because this will be our first attempt at a universal voter guide that, that hits from the top of the ballot um, all the way through your, uh, your, your state house mm -hmm. and, and Senate races. Um, the League of Women Voters in Vermont uh, is very active, and they do often um, host uh, candidate debates, uh, and they do produce a voter guide. Um, what we're hoping to do is make it, make it so easy and accessible to folks because it will be available at the same place where they can look at their ballot ahead of time, um, that that our voter guide will be the most comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, it's really challenging. You know, we have over 300 different ballot styles in any uh, general election in Vermont because of the different overlapping House and Senate districts and, and county districts. And so it's challenging for a, um, a group of volunteers, such as the League of Women Voters, to get each of those um, ballot styles captured in a way that someone could look at their ballot and also their voter guide in the same format. Um, but the collaboration, I think, is really going to be helpful in, in driving uh, candidates to provide their information. We don't currently have a requirement that candidates submit that 
And so I am blocking out time on my schedule in August to start calling people and saying, we haven't seen your, uh, your 150 word statement and I don't have your contact information. <laughs> so help me out here. Um, and and you know, I hope that we can collaborate with some of the other uh, you know, pro-democracy organizations to help us really drive people to participate in this. Uh, for some strange reason, sometimes when people are running for public office, they'd rather stay under the radar and not tell anybody anything about what, they're, what they stand for and what yep. they plan to do. And <laughs> that just seems like an odd, an odd stance to take as a mm -hmm. longtime public official. I you know, I'm pretty much have to be an open book. So um, I'm hoping that others will embrace the opportunity to mm -hmm. speak to their constituents. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm, I'm well. <clears throat> I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance uh, here. And I'm also the uh, co-chair of the Health Equity Advisory Commission for the state of Vermont. Um, it's good to see you. I'm sorry that it is that it's taken this long to, to say hi since you've been elected. Um, so um, I'm looking for the the um, the ethics piece that you were talking about on the on the um, on your website, so if, you, if, if some navigation would be helpful. I think that, um, I was really surprised actually, that being a, you know, as you know, oh, shout out to, um, to folks over in, uh, in Bradford as well, to your people. Um, yeah, I'm j I was really surprised, you know, you know, I've been in Vermont now for 15 years, and you know, I've been around, and I'm, I was actually disappointed to hear when I was thinking about the, um, because I'm looking at things from an equity lens, that's just a nice way inside a state government to say racial justice. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what kind of involvement that you know, uh, black and brown folks and, and folks from marginalized communities uh, have in that process. Um, and it's, it's uh, um, I think it was James Baldwin who said that once a black man is awake, he's in a constant state of rage. Um, and I, you know, as I'm listening to uh, the discussion, it's just, Part of it is just driving me up the walls. It's just that I'm, I'm learning how to manage that a little bit. But yeah, we would definitely be happy uh, to work with you. I was, I'm sorry to hear that the only, as far as I could hear involvement, is from the Office of Racial Equity, which is a political appointee of our Republican governor. Um, so I, I was disappointed to hear that, but I, but I am excited to hear that there is uh, ethics initiatives underway across the state. Um, it's um, troubling that that it's it's going out to 251 uh, cities already, uh, cities and towns across the state, and that it's already in play. Uh, and it sounds like once again um, we're talking about getting on a moving bus. So I'd, so I'd love to hear more about um, you know just uh, what the efforts were to to put the, not to put you on the spot, but even offline because we've got plenty of time to talk. Um, what the efforts were to, to get some equity baked into that process because I think it's incredibly important uh, across the state. And then finally, um, just uh, reaching out and saying, I'm happy to sit down with folks from your, um, from your team to work to see if we can back into that process if, if there's something that we can do to contribute to it. Um, so I think the most important thing right now for me is, is just point me to uh, on your website uh, where this is, uh, this is actually playing out. Thanks. Sure. Um, so let me make sure that I understand, Mark, your question. Are you, are you talking about the Civic Health Index, or are you asking for information on? As, as I understood, and, and I didn't have my first cup of coffee complete, uh, you said that there was an initiative that was underway uh, within the state secretary's office that was one of the five elements of the work that you do. Yes. Uh, within the state secretary's office. Yeah. So I'm, j I'm just looking for that on your website right now and trying to better understand how to be involved in it. Sure. Um, I think that our education and civic engagement um, landing page is uh, near completion. Robin's giving me the nod. Uh, or near launch, I shouldn't say near completion because this is going to be a, a long process of um, adding information as we go. Uh, because the education and civic engagement um, initiative is new, uh, it's taken us a, a few months. Robin just started in April, so she's hit the ground running, and uh, we will get more of that um, 
education and civic engagement information up on our website shortly. It will be um, in the special programs section, so where you find safe at home and temporary efficience and, uh, and now our civics program. Um, and to your point, uh, Dr. Hughes, Reverend Hughes, uh, about uh, making sure that we are taking a racial justice lens, uh, it is our hope that the Office of Racial Equity uh, will be able to um, provide to us data sets and information so that our Civic Health Index report helps us understand uh, discrepancies between uh, people of different races in terms of their civic participation and civic health. If I could just briefly redirect, I just I, I would just wanted to say, just to say that um, now it's clear. Thank you for that. Um, I would strongly implore the state secretary's office to reach out to the community and get qualitative data on yeah. uh, how we proceed with this process before we pull the trigger on it across the entire state. I would strongly implore you, Madam Secretary, uh, to do that. Um, and thanks for the clarification. Yeah. And just to, for clarity, it is not currently anywhere public, this program. It doesn't seem to be. Is, is that what I'm understanding? Um, public. Your well, website. So the Civic Health Index information is not yet up on our website. That's no, the, the program itself, the State Secretary's Office program that you just mentioned, it is not on your website, correct? No, but I've been talking about it for a year and a half as I, as I go around and engage with Vermonters. So to the extent that someone has come to a meeting that I was at, um, they will have heard me talking about this. So, so as, you, as, as you know, and for the folks in the room, um, the, as far as you know, community engagement and um, as far as racial justice work in Vermont, we are the preeminent organization that does that work in Vermont. And I am unaware of it. So all I'm doing is, is I'm offering you an opportunity to engage us, and I would be happy to work with folks from your staff during this process. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just want to do a time check. Another five minutes? Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I, I think, uh, is anyone else? have a question? Well, I think Mark brought up a really good point. You know, you've mentioned a couple times, and I've been hearing in conversations here too, around outreach. And in, in Vermont, we have so many different types of communities, and they all have different levels of professionalized government, or maybe it's like three volunteer select board members and a town okay. clerk. And, and so finding an outreach um, method that, that can work for as many people as possible, where are, for your office, where are the struggles and where, what have you found that's successful that maybe can help folks here who also need to do outreach? Right, in terms of meeting the needs of different, different communities, yeah. Um, you know, what we've noticed in conversations with our local government um, entities is that there's a wide range of resources available just in terms of being able to make those select board meetings accessible to the public. Um, you know, not every teeny little town in Vermont is lucky enough to have a, a community media uh, uh, outlet who's able to come and, and broadcast those meetings. Um, what we will do in the coming legislative session is we will advocate for um, our local select boards to be able to get a grant from the state to invest in some of the equipment that they need to make our uh, public meetings more available, more accessible to, uh, to folks in that community. And you know, the barrier to participation, as I've said, shouldn't be that you can, um, that you can afford a, a, a smartphone or a tablet or a computer. So we also will advocate that all of those meetings continue to have uh, an in-person component as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you still need to, I mean, even with all of the technology and all the skills that we've all learned during the pandemic, 
there is no substitute for being able to be in the room and to see who else is in the room. And that is not always possible when, uh, when you're watching from online. Um, mm -hmm. And so we will certainly advocate for that. Thank you. Any, any other questions for the Secretary of State? No? OK. <laughs> It's like an auction. If people move their hands, I'm like, oh, you, you, you. <laughs> Careful, I'll make you ask a question. You are the winning bid. <laughs> Lucky you. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Fantastic. Well, before you uh, head out, uh, so glad you could join us. Is there any last words you want to share or? Um, I I think I just want to say thank you to all of you because I know the important role that you all play in helping your neighbors stay connected with, with what's happening in their communities. Um, and it really is critically important, often, um, often not well understood, uh, the, uh, the amount of time and resources and care that needs to go into keeping, uh, keeping people um, connected to their community, to their local government. Um, so uh, in case other people in your communities don't say thank you, I want to say thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming out today. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Before, Have a wonderful time. Before everyone leaves, I just had a thought. As a suggestion, if you're looking for programming, visiting your town clerk's vault like the oh, archive. Oh, that's my favorite. You, yeah, you can find the original charters for your towns, the handwritten charters. It's amazing what they have in their vaults. Yes. So if you're looking for programming, I would highly recommend that. Now, now you all may go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. All right. Um, just a couple things. Thank you to our guests. It's a great conversation to start off our conference. Thank you, Olga, for moderating.